Welcome, Swallow family. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you could join us. My name is Sophia Barnett. We begin a new series for the month of September called The Root Route, Redeeming Relationships, going through the Book of Ruth. The speaker is our brother, Paul Hemmings, and the title of his message is Twists and Turns. Our summer worship series continues, so you know you're in for something special. Also remember to share this link with your friends and family. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. May God bless you as we worship together.
Good morning. Let's pray. Most righteous and heavenly Father, thank you for another day that we get together in your midst, dear Lord. Thank you that you are God alone and that you hear our prayers and that you reach out to us even when we don't reach out to you. I pray for those who are sick, Lord. You are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. We call upon your name right now to heal those who are sick right now. I pray that you will be with them in this hard time and that you will strengthen them in every single way. Whether it is their head, their back, their shoulders, wherever it is, whether it is any disease or anything the doctor says, no, we can't fix this, we can't cure this. I pray in your name that they will be healed and that your mighty hand will be seen in their lives and that they will glorify you because of it. Lord, I continue to pray for those who are grieving. Lord, your word says that you are close to those who are brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. I pray that you will be with them and that they will know your promise of being with them. I pray that you will just... Hold their hands, be with them constantly. I know that this is a rough time for them and that they may feel despair beyond comparison to anything they felt before, Lord. But please remind them that you are with them and that you will be with them in the future and that you'll never leave their side, Lord. Lord, as I continue to pray, I pray for um, Swallow Field. I pray that it will grow. I pray that um, our mission will be fulfilled to reach those who are lost and to make disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord. I continue to pray for the nation as we go farther and farther away from the Lord. I pray that a nation, a generation will, li will rise up and to represent you, Lord, in our nation. I continue to pray for those who are going back to school, Lord. Uh, many people right now don't know where the money is going to come from don't know where the the energy is going to come from and many are starting university with um away from home maybe they are just in a new experience Lord. i pray that you'll be with them that they won't stray from the right or from the left but they will stray they will keep their path straight and that you'll be with them constantly i pray that you will provide for them Lord and that they will know that you are their provider and that they shouldn't worry about these things because today has worries of their own and tomorrow will have worries of their own so I pray that you'll continue to guide and to bless them bless us abundantly Lord and we just thank you for all you've been doing in our lives and all you continue to do in Jesus' name Amen Hey everybody, please come out on September 10th at 6 p.m. at 912 Hill Road for Kingdom Hair. This is going to be an evening of worship as well as listening to some original music by me. Please bring your friends, bring your family, all your loved ones. This is a free event, so come out in your numbers. Would love to see you there. Bye. See you then. The scripture reading for today is taken from Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, through to the end. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrites from Bethlehem, Judah and they went to Moab to live there. Now, Emelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on a road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Na then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? 
Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her, was Ruth replied. Don't urge me to leave you or to return back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. Where they arrived, when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred up against them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Swallow. Great to be here with us again to share from God's holy word. We're just coming off our time of rest and we are running into our next series, our series on Ruth. We're looking at the book of Ruth, the Old Testament book of Ruth. And we're calling this series the Ruth Root Redeeming Relationship. And today, I'd like to look at the title of our sermon, which will be Twists and Turns. And so we're going to be looking at chapter one, first chapter of the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is a very short book, only four chapters. But that doesn't mean it's not an important book. It doesn't mean it's not a book that we can't learn from. In fact, there is much to learn from, from the book of Ruth. It is one of the two books in the Bible that is named of women, and the only book named after an ancestor of Jesus. In other words, Ruth is the great, 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 great grandmother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. It's the only book in the Old Testament named after a non-Jewish person. Ruth is a Gentile. She's a Moabite or a Moabitess. And this book of Ruth, we are not sure as to who the author is, but some believe that Samuel was the author of this book. Samuel being the very last judge of Israel. And this book is located in Bethlehem. Most of the book, the events of the book, takes place in the city of Bethlehem. That city is the same city that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born in. And these events also occurred early in the time of the book of Judges. In fact, the book starts out by telling us, now it came about in the days when the judges governed. So that gives us a clue as to when this book was written. Now the, the judges spanned over 400 years of Israel's 
history. And what we know from this is that the book of Ruth was written early in the time of the judges. How do we know this? Because Boaz, who became her husband, was um, the son of Rahab, who is the harlot. We often refer to Rahab as the harlot. And Rahab is featured in the book of Joshua, which comes just before the time of the judges. So we know that this story is early in the life of the history of the judges of Israel. The book of Ruth is a beautiful love story. A love story between a gentleman called Boaz and Ruth, of course. It's a fantastic love story, and we're going to get into it, especially next week, that love aspect of it. And I know you love a good love story. For, for, in fact, some of you love um, what, what, soap operas, and this is a lovely soap opera found in the scriptures. The name Ruth means compassionate friend. And throughout this book, she's going to play true to her name. The book is about providence. That is how, how God is in the background of the book and he's working all things together. It's a book that is about so that or in spite of. In other words, God works so that and God works in spite of. It's also a book of conversion. Ruth came to faith in Yahweh. Ruth, who was an estranged person, almost enemy of the state of Israel, became a, a, a convert to Yahweh, faith in Yahweh. It's a book also of redemption. In other words, people being reinstated. And we're going to be looking at a people and nation that was reinstated to God. In other words, they were redeemed unto God. And this book has an interesting progression. The book starts out with death and gloom and doom. It's, 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 it starts out with this, but the book ends up almost like happily and they lived happily ever after. In other words, the book starts out with sadness, but ends up with gladness. It starts out with darkness, but ends up at David. It starts out with gloom, but ends up in glory. It starts up with a degeneration, but it ends up with a regeneration. It starts up with a mess, but it leads us to the Messiah. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing about this book. And so as we get into chapter one, what we're going to see is that chapter one is divided into two sections. I call this a faithful turn to Moab. Faithful, F-A-T-E-F-U-L. But the second part speaks about a faithful Return to Bethlehem. And so we want to look at those two aspects of this chapter one and see what we can learn about this particular person, about from this particular book. And we're calling today's sermon, Twists and Turns. Verse one says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to reside in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name, of the, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. So they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then both Marlon and Kilian also died. And the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. This was a fateful, F-A-T-E-F-U-L, turn to Moab. That is, it had far-reaching and often disastrous consequences and implications for this family. What's interesting about this is that Ru Naomi and her husband Elimelech were leaving from Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was a house of bread. That's what the name Bethlehem means, house of bread. Yet in Bethlehem, there was a famine. And that is so ironic. It's, so, it's such a paradox that this is the name of this place, yet they are experiencing a famine. 
Another paradox we see in this portion that I just read is that Elimelech, his name means God is king. Yet he was not trusting God in his circumstances. Elimelech decided life was so hard, it's best if we leave to find life elsewhere. And it's interesting where they were going to find life and to make life. Naomi means pleasant. And in the long run, Naomi recognized that she was not living up to her name of being a pleasant person. In fact, she called her name herself Mara, which means bitter, which we're going to be seeing later on. And another irony that we find in these five verse, first five verses is that their sons Marlon and Killian had very strange names. Marlon means sick. And Killian means tired. In other words, it seems as though Elimelech was saying, we are sick and tired of what was going on. It seems as though these two boys were born sickly and one was born looking almost half dead, dying, in a, you know, crying all the time, not in a very happy mood. And so these were the names given to these boys. But it almost sums up what is about to now happen to this family eventually. And what we see in these first five verses is that this family is moving from Bethlehem and they're going on to Moab. And the writer of this book is trying to help us to understand that this is painting a dark picture first so that we might appreciate what God is about to do. You know, when, 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 a, when a jeweler brings out a diamond, for us to appreciate the diamond, the jeweler places that diamond on a black cloth. Because when the diamond is contrasted with the black cloth, you get to appreciate the beauty, the magnificence of this diamond. And I believe that God is painting this book of Ruth on a black canvas. Whereas he's, he's helping us to understand that the, pic, the, the, the picture, the portrait he's about to paint, we can appreciate it because it is being painted on this dark black surface. And so the book starts out with this doom and gloom. The book starts out with, with a spiraling and a spiraling downwards. In fact, if we're going to understand the book of Ruth, we must appreciate how the book starts out with this doom and gloom, this sadness and this, 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 this bizarre kind of a occasion that is happening. In fact, the writer says, the time of judges. And in the time of judges, every single man did what was right in the, uh, his own eyes. Can you imagine a Jamaica where we're living in a country where everybody does what they want to do? And of course, many of us like Elimelech would want to take flight, maybe, to another, to another country. In fact, the book, the time of Judges was a time of anarchy, rebellion, relativism, wild, wild west, Jews gone wild, instability, disobedience, chaos, civil unrest, and it was survival of the fittest. It was a dog eat dog kind of a world. In fact, 2 Chronicles verse 15 tells us this, and I'm reading from the Message Bible, just to sum up the time of the judge. It says, For a long time Israel didn't have the real God, nor did they have the help of priest or teacher or the book. But when they were in trouble and got serious and decided to seek God, the God of Israel, God let himself be found. At that time, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Life was constantly up for grabs. No one, regardless of country, knew what the next day might bring. Nation battered nation. City pummeled city. God let loose every kind of trouble among them. Just a summary as to what was happening. And what we see from this book is that there was a spiraling down, especially for this family. There was a spiraling downwards. First of all, we hear for Israel, it was a time of judges. And secondly, not just a time of judges, but there was a famine. No, things got increasingly worse. There was a famine. And oftentimes famine can be caused from natural forces, you know, the wind coming in and blowing off the crops and so on. There's drought. 
or, or there's an invasion of the oppressor. This time it seemed as though maybe all of that was happening, but God was behind this famine. And the spiral continues. The family now moved to Moab, Moab of all places. You must remember that Moab in the book of, of Judges was one of those countries that oppressed the children of Israel. And now Elimelech took his family and they are now moving to Moab to find work, to find a better way of life. No, no, this is like Ukrainians moving to Russia for work. Just imagine that. So, so this is a, a spiraling down. It's almost you're, you're really desperate because of the desolation that's happening in your own country. And not just that, things got even worse. Elimelech died. The main breadwinner of the family died. No, they, they went to Moab to, to, to for better life. No, the main breadwinner of that family is now dead. This support is gone. And what now is a family going to do? Because... For a man to be leading his family in Israel, that was a, a big thing. He was the, the main person, main support. And so Naomi and her boys were missing their father and husband. It got worse because now the boys got married to Moabite women. And this was a no-no. This you, you don't do. That's taboo. You just don't do that. You were forbidden. The, 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 Moab, the Moabites were looked down on. You just don't do that. But just to paint the picture, that's how desperate, that's how destitute, that's how damning things were becoming for this particular family. It got even worse. The two sons of Naomi died. Now, what was Naomi, not just a widow, but now childless, going to do? When Elimelech died, that wasn't too bad because she could depend on her sons. But now they were gone. What was she going to do? And now her two daughters-in-law are now widows. And she also is a widow. And they could be easily be taken advantage of. And so just painting a picture that life was getting out of sorts. Let me just pause and say that sometimes your life might be spiraling out of control. Sometimes your life might be a life that things are just not happening the way they're supposed to happen. It's, it's tragedy upon tragedy, problems upon problems, death, disgrace, all sorts of things are happening to you and you just seem not to be able to get a grip of it. In other words, it's almost like a ground hog day for you. The same old, same old. You seem not to be able to come out of this hole that you find yourself in. Tragedy seems to be the order of the day for you. I want to urge you to trust God as this family is going to recognize that's what they needed to do. What do we do when trouble comes our way? And there are different responses we can have to trouble when they come our way. We can endure the trial, but risk becoming bitter. We can escape the trial and miss God's purpose or plan, as Elimelech tried to do. Or we can enter the trial and allow God to teach us, to increase our faith, and to help us to grow. Another thing we see happening is not just, we saw some paradoxes happening. We saw the picture of them spiraling down. But there are also some pitfalls that we, we see in this particular text, verse 1 through to 5. If we must also understand the theme of redemption, we must understand who is being redeemed First of all, the nation of Israel is being redeemed. It is a time of the judges. And what this means is that it was a time of anarchy. It was a time of disobedience. It meant that Israel had nothing, wanted nothing to do with God. And therefore, Israel needed to be redeemed. And this is why the famine came upon the land, because they were far from God. And they needed redemption. Not just Israel, but Elimelech. And his family, his clan, also needed redemption. Because they had lost everything and now they needed that redemption. And I want you to notice the, the conical shape that's happening. A nation moving to a family and then we move to 
the single woman called Naomi. She too needed redemption. The fact that she lost her family, her husband and her boys, it meant she also lost any property that she and her family owned. Because as a woman, she could not own that for herself. She owned it through her husband or her son. So even Naomi needed redemption, needed reinstating, needed to be given back what she lost. Ruth was another person in the story, a stranger though, who needed this redemption as well. She lost her husband. She was childless and she was husbandless. She too needed redemption. And a stranger, but she needed redemption. So this book of Ruth is about redemption, redeeming not just a nation, but a family and also individuals. This book of Ruth is about redemption for you and for me. Because we too need, if we're, especially if we're outside of Christ, we need to be reinstated into the family of, of God. And so we see this faith, faithful turn to Moab, this, this devastating turn to Moab, this, this, this turn that meant that things were going to be bad in Moab. That's what we see and we have the privilege of seeing this in hindsight. Uh, Elimelech and his family did not, were not able to see this because they were going right into it. But looking back, we can now see that this was a fateful move. A devastating move. A move downward. Sometimes we think that we're moving into a situation which will make us better when it's going to make us bitter. I'm reminded as we go on, and I'm not even saying that, that you know, teachers are wrong to this, but in, in recent times in our news, we have, we have an exodus of teachers who are leaving for better, who are leaving for a good life. And friends, I want to say this, that if we think that we're moving from one place to another for material benefits, and that will give us a better life, we have made a sad mistake because only God and having God can give us a peace of mind. And I wish somebody would say amen in their living room. So we have this faithful move to Moab, but we also see a faithful move to return to Bethlehem. A faithful return to Bethlehem. The text says, And then she, then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the land of Moab, because she heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them food. And so she's going to make a faith move back home, a return back home. And this part of the text is very important because 12 times in this portion of the text, there are references to returning or the derivative of this word return. When you count it, I count it, in verse 6 we have return. In verse 7 we have return two times. In verse uh, 10 we have the word return, verse 11, and so on. So it's a big theme in this portion of the text that God is trying to show us that yes, Naomi returned to Bethlehem, but also her daughters also returned to Bethlehem as well with her. And you might be wondering, what's the significance of that? Or well, somebody once says, says this, puts it this way, in Ruth, the repetitive return underscores the necessity of the characters to find a way back from exile, famine, loss of family, and loss of future to fullness or wholeness. At one level, then, the book is about exile and return. And I'm speaking to somebody, whether you're a Christian or not, that there needs to be a return to where you come from. There needs to be a turning away. There needs to be repentance. Because only so can you find that what this spiraling that you're experiencing can become a different movement upward. Upward mobility. I want to call it, when we return to where our first love and to where we, have, where we came from, when we return to Bethlehem. And what is interesting about this is that in verse 7, 
we read, so she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now listen to me and listen to me well because what this is telling us is that Naomi wasn't the only one who returned but also her daughters-in-law also returned. Now that's an interesting way to put it because we can understand that Naomi returned, but how is it we're talking about Orpah and Ruth wanting to return? Because they have never, ever been to Israel. They were never, ever citizens of Bethlehem. Yet the scripture says that they returned. Hear what verse 22 says. So Naomi returned with her, with her Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law who, watch this, returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. What this is telling us is that it seems as though Ruth and Orpah had taken on the Jewish faith. In other words, scholars believe that they became converted. And now they were owning the Jewish faith and almost owning the Jewish land and owning Bethlehem. And for them, it was a returning to where they really be be uh, belong because of their husbands, Marlon and Chilean. And it seemed as though there was some proselytizing going on, whereas uh, Naomi shared her faith with her daughters-in-law and they bought into that faith that their mother-in-law shared with them. Therefore, there are two, it is said to us that they were planning to return with her, or their own words, return with her to Bethlehem. There are three kinds of returning that I wanted to share with us. There are three ways that one can return. And I want to share with us from this last part of the text. First of all, we see a returning of Arpa. Now, Arpa started out with her mother-in-law on the way to Bethlehem. And along the way, somewhere, some, some path along the way, Naomi stopped and she said to them, listen, girls, it's best if you go back home. Uh, girls, it's best if you leave me because I, I don't think you should come with me because things are going to be bad and it's going to be, it's going to get worse for us there in Bethlehem. And I don't want to put you under that pressure. In fact, if you're coming hoping that I'll find a husband and maybe have children, how long will you wait for, 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 for me to have children so you can, you can marry these children? Remember, that, that was, the, the, that has to do with liberate, uh, laws. Whereas if, if a, if a brother died, then the younger brother who followed that brother should marry his bride so that the, the, the possessions and properties can be passed on to the bride and it is kept in her, in her line. And this is what Naomi is referring to. And the scripture says to us that Arpa and Ruth told her flat out, no, we are coming with you. But then Naomi still pressed on and she says to them, listen, please, for God's sake, leave and go back to Unuyad because you don't want to come home with me. Now, we don't know if, Martha, if Nehomi was a little bit embarrassed that the, the, these were Moabite women and they were going back now to Israel and the Israelites looked down on Moabite women. We, we're not sure what's going on here, but, but what we know is that she doesn't want them to come because she thinks that life for her is going to be hard in Israel. And it's basically they return home to their mother's house so that they can find some sort of a relief. And the Bible says that Arpa, the second time, took Naomi seriously and she left. No, no, no. This, this is t telling us that, that, that Arpa returned to her gods and to her people. She returned to her ease of life. She, she returned in the flesh. She, 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 she believed that she was better able to find a husband where she was going. She, she believed that, that her husband was what she needed to provide for her, for her needs. And what this is telling us is that many times you and I remain in a backsliding position or we go into a backsliding position because we believe that we know better than what God knows. We believe that life will be better off if we do 
what we want to do outside of God's will. Because to do what God wants to do, God is not smart enough. In fact, God is a killjoy. And God can't give me what I need. So Arpa went back. In other words, she returned backwards. And there are times in my life when I return backwards. There are times in my life when I, I return to a place of familiar, familiarity. I return to a place where, where I think that things are going to go well. I return to a place where I, I, I think that this is just the best right now. And God will simply understand. But it is a return backwards. It's not a forward move at all. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a place of progression and a, a place of prosperity when it is definitely not. And I lose focus of God to trust my own instinct. And that was ARPA. Returning backwards. I know it's bad language, but you get what I'm trying to say. She returned backwards. But, but let's look at Ruth. Let's look at Ruth. Ruth kept her word. And Ruth, the scripture says, clung to her mother-in-law. Arpa kissed her mother-in-law and left. Now I want you to watch this. Watch out for people who kiss you. It could be a kiss of death. Another person that kissed in the scriptures was Judas. Well, Arpa kissed her mother-in-law and went back home. The Bible says that Ruth clung to her mother-in-law. And she says something very, very beautiful. What I'm about to read to you is some verses that I use when I'm doing weddings, when I'm, when I'm officiating weddings. It's a powerful line. These are powerful words that Ruth is about to recite to Naomi. Hear what she says in verse 16. But Ruth says, do not plead with me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you sleep, I will sleep. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and worse, if anything but death separates you and me. Those are beautiful words. But, but Ruth is, show, is sharing her resolve that she was serious about her commitment. And she's placing, she's solidifying. She's recommitting her faith in Yahweh. She says, your God will be my God. I don't care what you want to say. I'm not going anywhere because I, I listened to your teaching. You brought us to faith in Yahweh. And we are not, I am not going anywhere. Your God is going to be my God. She clung to her. She was a cleaver. She, she made a sincere commitment. She made a spiritual commitment. And she made a steadfast commitment. She said, where you die, I am going to die. I'm not leaving you. So don't tell me to leave you because I'm going to cling to you. In other words, Ruth returned bold and blessed. And we're going to see that further as we go into the book of Ruth. She returned with a boldness and she returned into a blessedness. In other words, she kept her word. And we need more people like that around us. People who are loyal. People who are not in it just for the, 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 the fame and the fanfare. But people who are in it for the faithfulness and are going to stay true to what they know. So we see our part returning backwards. We see Ruth returning with boldness and blessed. And we see Naomi as well. She returned, she returned, but she returned with bitterness. Somebody said bitterness. She returned with bitterness. And many of us are bitter towards God. Many of us, yes, we come to church. Yes, we, we participate. We're involved in ministry. But there's a bitterness we have towards God. Many of us, yes, God, God has shouted to us in our, and we have responded, but we came back to God kicking and screaming, just like Naomi. Because Naomi blamed God for her situation and her circumstances. In fact, it started out this way because she was so bitter 
she was so she lost perspective of God so much so that she encouraged Arpa to go back to her people and her gods. Can you imagine that? You, you led Arpa to Yahweh. You told Arpa about Yahweh. Now you're telling, you're dissuading your Arpa. You're telling her to go back to her gods because maybe your gods can do something about your scenario. Maybe your gods and your people can provide you with a husband because all you want to survive in this world is a good husband. And I'm talking to some ladies now who think that, boy, if I can just get a husband, my problem solved. Not quite, quite so. She encouraged Arpa to go back to her people and her gods. And friends, watch this. We have to be careful what we tell people and how we encourage people as Christians. Because sometimes I think we compromise so much that we encourage people on a, on, along pragmatic lines. We encourage people along lines where we think this might, God will understand so you can do that because he will understand. And we encourage them along that line. In fact, or, uh, no, Naomi pronounced a blessing, a Yahweh blessing upon Arpa to go back to her gods. Can you imagine the irony of that? that that's, so, that's so funny. That's so weird. But she did just that. And I wanted to, to challenge us that we do a similar thing as Naomi in that we tell people certain things that are not quite so and we call ourselves Christian. And that happens to me as well. For example, we tell our kids that the key to success is education. The key to success, we tell them, is education. And we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll do everything. We'll, we'll tear down heaven and earth, pull up earth, just to make sure that they're properly educated. And when they get that, then is when we want now for them to come back. We want them to come into the faith. Because the, the faith, the Christian faith, is an add-on to education. Education is the be-all and the end-all. But the, 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 the faith is a kind of add-on thing. In other words, now that you've gotten that and you're successful, why don't you come to Jesus now? That's what we tell people. That's what we tell our kids. That's, that's how we, we don't, we don't necessarily tell them literally like that, but that's, that's how we behave. That's our conduct. And they get this impression that if I can only go to school and do well, then life will be well. That's a wrong thing. How many of us, Sunday school is going to start back soon here at Swallow? And what if, what if Uncle Paul and others tell us that there's, there's, these are some books you need to get for Sunday school, you know? This is the book list for Sunday school. How many of us would take that really seriously? But no, you and I, we're in the mood right now for back to school and we're running, we're running up and down because education is serious. But how serious is the faith? In fact, our children can tell us, I don't feel like going to church this morning. And that's, that's okay, that's okay, that's, that's rest. But when Monday morning comes, they can't tell us that. Because school is important. And I'm saying to us, in that way, we are similar to Naomi because we're giving bad counsel. We're, we're preaching a bad theology. Because Naomi is telling Arpa, if you go back home, things will be much better. Not just that, but Naomi, and, and one asks you the question, how might your action be turning another from Yahweh? The things you say, the practical counsel you give, what, what, what you encourage me. How might that be turning people away from Yahweh and we don't have a problem doing it? Not just that, Naomi, she doubted what could possibly happen. She was walking by sight and not by faith. Hear what verse 11 and 12 says. She says, but Naomi, it says, but Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. In other words, she was trusting in the flesh. All she could see is that she couldn't do anything. And therefore, if she can't do anything, there's nothing that could be possibly be done to, to salvage the situation. You and I are just like that. Paul Hemings is just like that. You are just like that. We walk by, 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 by sight and not by faith. And we are, might I remind you, a people of faith. And Naomi also saw only one dimension to God. She thought that God was attacking her. She thought well, God was so mad and upset with her that God had a beef with her. She thought that God was in feelings. 
She couldn't see that God was trying to steer her away from further danger. God was shouting to her to get her attention, to move back into the blessings that he had there for her. That's why he was shouting at her. And I say shouting because God often talks softly to us and was prodding us a little bit, but we don't have to listen to that. And God often talks a little bit louder, but we don't listen to that. But when God shouts, meaning God sent a tragedy or a crisis in our life, is that time we want to hear God. Well, God shouted at her. And she finally heard what God was saying to her. She also went against herself. I know she called herself bitter, Mara. Now watch this. You see, when you're bitter, when you're bitter, it affects three persons, three, three sets of persons. When you're bitter, it affects God because you're bitter against God. And when you're bitter, you tend to turn on yourself as well. It says that she called herself bitter. When she went home, and she, the people were, were there, and, and maybe she heard a boombox playing, um, um, you, you're rich, you, you never send your money, you come my yard, squander your money, you now you're living like dog, you know, the Bujabantan song, and she was returning, and the people were there, and the people them said, but, but the name of me that. She never have a nice little um, Gucci bag or nothing like that. She, she, it's a scandal bag she come back with. No, not at all. She said, don't call me Naomi. Don't, don't call me Naomi. She vex. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Me bitter. You, you, when you're with bitterness, you tend to turn on yourself as well. And not just that. The Bible says that she also said, hear what she says to the people. And this I find very interesting. She said, do not call me Mara. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? She says, the Lord has brought me back empty. Is that true? She came back with Ruth. And Ruth, as we're going to see, I'm so excited about this. Ruth, as we're going to see, was going to be the person that brought her back into prosperity. And she has Ruth beside her. The people are saying, what going to happen? What did they want to go? Kind of thing. And she said, the Lord brought me back empty. And almost she's disregarding Ruth. The Bible says that we should not despise small beginnings. It's like she dis Ruth. But you know, I like Ruth because Ruth never take that personal. Ruth never go into her feelings. Ruth just stood there and she hears say, she don't have nothing. That's what Naomi was saying, me don't have nothing. Me don't come back with nothing. And Ruth is saying like, but I am here. But this is what bitterness does. We can't see God in the right perspective. We can't see ourselves in the right perspective. And we can't see people in the right perspective. And we can't see that God has our interests at heart. And when God screams at you, even crisis and tragedy, he's trying to spare you from something greater. And hear this, verse 22, and we're closing. It says, so Naomi returned. Hear this good. With her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. See the word coming back? You never said she turned from the land of Moab, but she returned from the land of Moab. Watch this. And they came to Bethlehem. Watch this now. At the beginning of barley harvest. And they came to Bethlehem. At the beginning of barley harvest. In other words, things start going. Things start happening for Naomi and Ruth and other things that first of all happened for Israel. So it seemed as though Israel cried out to God and God responded to Israel. And because of them crying out to God, God responded. Now there was blessing upon Israel and now Naomi walked back right into blessing. She never even stayed with the people. She didn't endure what they went through. But she's walking right now into blessing. And this is how the chapter ends she came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley 
harvest. Can I tell somebody that God wants to change your circumstances? Your circumstance might, might start out poorly, but God wants to end up richly. Your circumstance might start out sad, but God wants to make you glad. You might be spiraling downwards, but God wants to lift you up. Come on, somebody. You, you might be experiencing drought, but God wants to drive you into a land of plenty. She comes to Bethlehem, the house of bread, at the beginning of barley harvest. In other words, there's a long season ahead, mama. There's a long season ahead of, of God just blessing you and you walking into that blessing. Do not count God out. And your life might begin this way, but God has a plan. And this is what we call the providence of God. God is seeing into eternity. You and I are very myopic in how we're seeing things. We're very narrow in our vision. But God is seeing broadly and God is going to bring you out. But you have to trust him. Trust him. There may be twists and turns, but at the end of the road, there is the cross. There may be twists and turns, but at the end of the road, God has a plan. There may be twists and turns in your life, but hold on, sister. Hold on, brother. Hold on, my friend, because God is not done with you yet. And this is just chapter one, but God wants to give us a glimpse of what is going to happen into chapter two and the rest of the book that he's trying to tell us that I am not done and I'm giving you a glimpse as to what I can do. Because you simply trust me. A faithful move to Moab, but a faithful move, return to Bethlehem. I want to encourage you today, return to Bethlehem. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And may you be a blessing to somebody else. As you return to your Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Thank you. Right now, friends, we're going to be just spending a, uh, having a time of worship. The praise team has a song lined up for us. We're just going to be worshiping the Lord right now. So I invite you just to celebrate and to worship God. There may be twists and turns, but worship God right now at the beginning of your barley harvest. Bless you. Listen up.
take a second because this room is fresh with the spirit of God and I just keep hearing like he's dwelling on the throne of our praises and and when the Lord shows up in our room miracles happen when the Lord shows up in our room chains are broken off um, so I just feel led by the spirit to pray even now and I really believe that the Lord is about to do something powerful in this room you know what you brought into this room today and I mean, we never expect it because we come to just worship and record and we, we don't know what the Holy Spirit does, but there's a suddenly that happens when it doesn't, it, we don't understand it. It's it, like it happens so quickly. The Lord moves so quickly and it's like a flash. So I just want to invite us, just you and God just to pray. Let's just not waste this opportunity. I just keep getting a vision of like in the days of the prophet Isaiah when Jesus was entering the temple and there was the train of his robe. Just walk, just walk. Just the train of his robe entering into the temple. That's the posture that we need to have right now. Jesus entering into the room, walking and weaving his way through this place. The Holy Spirit coming down. That's the expectation that we need. Fixed, eyes fixed on the Lord. You know what you need broken off of your life. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the presence of Jesus. This is the moment. This is the moment. This is the moment. Don't let it pass by. This is your window of opportunity. Whatever you need broken off. assembling an army to see the greatest revival of souls known to man. You are the generation and I am asking you today to lay down every personal agenda and take up the weapons I've prepared for I the Lord I'm coming like a flood. With a mighty rush of my spirit this nation will be transformed and I'm calling you. Let this remnant rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Prophesy to these dry bones. Stand upon the authority I have given to you. Lay it all down. Pick up the cross. Know that this is not like anything of the past. What is about, what is ahead is far greater than the latter days of the church. My church will come alive. I'm not asking, I'm commanding. Church, come alive. Come alive. I am the Lord, the ancient of days. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And I will shake until you are unshakable. I'm preparing an unshakable kingdom. Stand firm. By, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit just flow through this place, Lord Jesus, and separate us from our sins. God, we lay it all down on the altar right now. Lord, I pray that you raise up this remnant, Lord, raise up this remnant.
fall upon this place, Lord Jesus. We declare that dry bones will come alive again. That God, you would disrupt the church, that it won't be business as usual, Lord, but that your Holy Spirit would move in such a powerful way. I declare even now, Lord Jesus, strongholds be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. Every single stronghold in this room be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. We declare your fresh wind upon your people, almighty God. We declare, almighty God, that your spirit will come down like never before. We're not here just singing songs. We're here to commune with your Holy Spirit, God. So even now, Lord Jesus, every single heaviness that has entered this room, I declare a lifting even now in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare a lifting of your spirit, every heavy spirit, almighty God. And I pray for a fresh filling, a fresh infilling of your spirit, God. Oh God, give us ears to hear you, Lord Jesus. Give us ears to hear you, almighty God. Heirs to hear you, Father. A heir to discern the next move, Almighty God, what you want to do in this nation. God, I pray that you would raise up an army in this room, Almighty God, that would go forth. That would go forth and trample every single demonic force that wants to bring destruction to this nation. But I declare even now that a remnant and an army is rising up in this room. Holy Spirit, saturate our atmosphere. Saturate the atmosphere of this nation, Lord Jesus. Saturate our atmosphere, Almighty God, and lead us. Lead us, Almighty Father, to still waters. I thank you for the move that you're preparing. We say we're ready. We're ready to enter into the next. We're ready to enter into the new. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, you still desire to dwell among your people. And you desire to dwell in us. Thank you, Jesus. This is a house of worship and This is a place of praise Where every demon trembles And where we proclaim your name So come alive in the name of Jesus, come alive. In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. And we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus, because this is a house of miracles. Would you come alive? Help your church to come alive. Cause there's resurrection power. Your blood runs through our veins. And your kingdom triumphs over. And even the coldest grave.
have been blessed so far and I just want to pronounce a blessing upon all of you and I just want you to just have this posture wherever you are just have this posture as I pronounce this blessing upon you now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory to the all wise God be blessing dominion and power both now and forever amen God bless you be blessed and be a blessing this week. Even though there may be twists and turns, keep on the Ruth note. Bless you. To receive confidential prayer, call, email, or text. WhatsApp or call us today up to 11.30 a.m. at 876-521-9437 or 876-877-9794. And mail call us. Your number is 876 371 0898 or you may email your requests to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or by text to 876-877-9794 if you're visiting with us for the first time we say welcome and we invite you to complete the contact card in the link below so you can connect with us god bless you thank you for giving in these troubled times here are a few convenient ways to do so you may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Swallowfield Chapel BNS New Kingston current account. The account number is 804-161, branch number 50575. Or you may log on to swallowfieldchapel.org and click GIF to make your direct online contribution. If you're making a contribution for food care packages, please indicate so. We will continue to host just one face-to-face in-person service at 9 a.m. each Sunday until further notice. Our online service will continue as usual also at 9 a.m. on Sundays. Hey everybody, please come out on September 10th at 6 p.m. at 912 Hill Road for Kingdom Hair. This is going to be an evening of worship as well as listening to some original music by me. Please bring your friends, bring your family, all your loved ones. This is a free event, so come out in your numbers. Would love to see you there. Bye, see you then. It's back to Sunday school time. Our Zoom Sunday school resumes next Sunday, September 11 at 8 a.m. And face-to-face in-person Sunday school starts on September 18 at 9 a.m. As of September 18, we will have both Zoom and in-person Sunday school classes for children ages 3 to 12 years old. We also need teachers. Please reach out to Catherine Preston in the church office to volunteer to teach Sunday school. Registration for adult Christian education classes and connect groups opens on Sunday, September 11. Be sure to look out for new offerings such as our grief share groups. And remember, we are still seeking disciples who want to make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ and are willing to serve as small group leaders. Support and training are provided. For further information, 
email discipleship at swallowfieldchapel.org or click the link below to apply. Let us be disciples who make disciples. Is there any other kind? Swallowfield Chapel's Divorce Care Ministry is now open for registration for the upcoming semester. The in-person group, which will begin on September 13, and the online group, which will begin on September 14. To register for either of these groups, please click the link below. Let us look forward to a time of hope and healing together. Swallowfield Chapel will host our 52nd Anniversary and Long Service Awards Dinner on Sunday, October 16, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the Grand Jamaica Suite, Pegasus Hotel, New Kingston. Tickets are $5,000 for adults and $3,500 for children 3 to 12 years old. In-person tickets go on sale in the foyer after service next Sunday or at the church office on weekdays. Live streaming pay-per-view tickets will be available online via spuropen.com for 30 US dollars. Don't delay. Get your tickets as soon as they become available. More Marriage Ministry presents More Couples Weekend, October 28 to 30, 2022. To register, please send an email to familymatters at swallowfieldchapel.org. Are you in perfectly good health with an A or O blood type and willing to donate a kidney to a solo who is in critical need? If yes, then please contact info at swallowfieldchapel.org for more information. All related expenses such as accommodation, airfare to New York for the transplant, among other attendant costs will be covered. We welcome your prayerful consideration of this Love in Action opportunity. Youth Reaching Youth invites registration of students between the ages 16 to 20 years old for the new academic year 2022 to 2023. CAPE and CSEC subjects, vocational skills training and more. YRY, transforming communities and nations through empowered Christ-centered youth leaders. And remember, all are welcome to join every weekday morning and on Saturdays for online prayer meeting from 6.30 to 7.30. For the links to these and other activities, visit swallowfieldchapel.churchcenter.com. May God bless you as we worship together.